So this morning we continue what began last Sunday, this new sermon series called The Movement. And together we're going to be working through the, the book of Acts. We just began, and as we hear the story, the disciples, as Hannah just said, uh, they're waiting. They're in this waiting stage, as Jesus said, I've got something more for you to do, but now you have to wait. And we all have times when we just have to wait. A week ago, I was feeling the same chest pains in my heart that I did four years ago. Got up Saturday morning and sort of felt this pain down my arm. Thought, okay, did the whole nitro thing, didn't change anything. Thought, I'd, I'd try to go check this out. Get to the hospital, and I'm, I'm okay. I'm not having a heart attack, but my levels are elevated. Something's going on, so you have to stay. I could have gone home and had a you know, heart cat at the end of this week and then figured out said, something's going on, so we better figure it out before you go. And doing five services is probably not a good idea. <laughs> so there I was stuck Easter weekend again in a hospital bed by myself waiting. Waiting sucks, doesn't it? When you don't know what's going to happen, when you don't know what this all means, so you have to wait to see what's going on. So you spend time alone, you know, doing Easter on a computer in your lap by yourself in a hotel. And waiting is terrible. And they come back and say, hey, you didn't have a heart attack. Got a little stuff going on down there. We got to take care of you. And the bottom line is not to have to wait now. You can't wait anymore. Dude, you got to get healthy. So you're ready to see the, uh, this felt lean, mean fighting machine in a few months. Uh, <laughs> that's the desperate prayer. I don't know if it's going to go. It has to happen. <laughs> Joanne, you know, pastor had that sermon about you know, the boat came by and the helicopter came by. He said, you got two shots, dude. The third one might be you're out, so it's time. Waiting. You ever had to wait, like for test results, or wait for a, an answer to a decision, and you're just sort of stuck in that place? Most of us are not at all fond of waiting. How many of you get upset when there's slow people in the line in front of you? Or uh, impatient with your kids when you're on the phone. They just want it now. They want to interrupt. They got to want it now. Like, no, you got to wait. Wait, wait. You're at the doctor's office, and it seems like it takes forever to finally get to you. You're there on time, but you have to sit in the, and wait. I think all of us find in those times when we have to wait that we're kind of anxious. And we're all, at this point, sort of anxious about getting vaccinated and getting to that point where you can say there's herd immunity. Uh, you get my point. So what do you do when you have to wait? This morning we're going to go back to the disciples in that early stage and sort of ask, what did they do while they were waiting? We're in Acts chapter 1. If you want to open your Bible, you can do that. If you have your app on the phone, you can open the Bible. We're going to start today in the book of Acts with Acts chapter 1. And we have sort of this hashtag thing going on that's uh, hashtag HCLC Indie or hashtag on the move. So if things come up over the next couple of 16 weeks, we're going to start our own little sort of movement together uh, and try to find a social media way to say Holy Cross is, is on the move. So uh, if you know what to do with that, have at it. Now everyone, especially the disciples, had been in, in shock. Jesus had been brutally tortured and he had been crucified. And they wondered what it meant for this movement that Jesus had started, what they had done together with him, was that movement dead? And you can imagine the disciples talking on Good Friday night and all through Saturday. For three years they had walked with him and they listened and Peter and James and John saw him transfigured on a mountain. They believed in him. Had they been duped? Why did God allow this to happen? It didn't fit anything that they thought was supposed to be. Was everything that Jesus taught and promised, was that dead too? Was any of it true? Jesus was supposed to be establishing the kingdom of God. Were they supposed to continue that mission? But how could they do that without the king, without Jesus? They were grieving and confused and a little bit scared that they might be next. And then Easter happened. What was supposed to happen now that the tomb is empty and Jesus is alive? They still didn't know. What does that mean? How does that shift their understanding? What's supposed to be happening next? So last week we walked with those two guys on the road to Emmaus and he reveals to them who he is and explains to them how all the Old Testament pointed to him. That all this was supposed to happen. And they run back to tell the other disciples, we saw him alive when he broke the bread. So what happens next? 
for the perfect biblical amount of time. 40 days. Isn't that cool? Jesus starts his ministry, 40 days being tempted by the devil. He ends his life 40 days revealing he really is God. The plan is done to his disciples. And during those 40 days, he says he gave them many convincing proofs. He proved to them he was truly alive. He ate with them, walked with them, talked with them, shared the story with them. And he spends time with Peter, remember, sort of restoring him back so he can actually become the leader of this new movement without guilt and shame for his betrayal of Jesus. What about their expectations for building this kingdom of God? Jesus was going to be king, but he flipped their understanding upside down of what that actually meant. What was the Messiah supposed to do and accomplish? The kingdom wasn't about a nation or political power. The kingdom was about God with us. Like Adam and Eve walking in the garden, talking to God and sharing life. They were with God, walking and talking, to restore that sense of a relationship with God. That Jesus was there to to rule their hearts. It was about the forgiveness of sins and about living in a relationship with God. No, No matter where you are, what government's in power, it was a kingdom that was about a relationship between God ruling in our hearts. Jesus came to make us right with God. And even the disciples struggled to grasp, what does this actually mean now? Even after Jesus appeared and started talking, he was hanging around with them. In fact, the Gospel of of Luke ends and the Acts begins. The disciples are staying with Jesus, saying goodbye. They still don't quite understand it. They don't get what's going on. They say, Lord, are you at this time going to restore the kingdom of God? God's plan was to be with us. The movement of God's love on the planet, the forgiveness of sins, the guaranteed relationship because Jesus guarantees forgiveness. That movement was about to begin. And Jesus knew they needed one more thing. So if you have Acts, you can turn to verse 4. Do not leave Jerusalem, but wait for the gift my Father promised, which you have heard me speak about. For John baptized with water, but in a few days you will be baptized with the Holy Spirit. He says, wait, hold on, chill out for a second because I have a job for you. And he goes on. You will receive power when the Holy Spirit comes. We're dynamis, it's like the dynamite. You receive the power of God. Remember in the past, God spoke to the, the prophets and the kings and the teachers and the priests. God spoke through them. The Holy Spirit was alive and at work to get the word out. But now the Holy Spirit was going to be given to every individual believer that you would be the ones to pour this story of God to the world. And you will be my witnesses in Jerusalem and in Judea and all Samaria, even to the ends of the earth. You are now to witness the story, to witness the plan being fulfilled. Jesus tells his disciples, The movement we started together is not over. The power of the Holy Spirit will now come upon you. It's just begun. What started with Jesus grew to a few. The few then grew to become many. And that movement of God's love and forgiveness, it's still going on. It continues in us. It continues in you and me. For three years, he taught the disciples and laid the groundwork for the movement. He completed God's plan. He sacrificed himself for the forgiveness of sins. He victoriously rose from the dead. His part of the plan was complete. As he declared on Good Friday, it's done. His part's done. Now God's plan shifted. The movement now is to be led by this small group of people, led by 11 ordinary guys. And their first assignment was to wait. You ever been there? Like waiting, anticipating something you know is happening? Like you're in the locker room before the game, sort of waiting to go out, you kind of get the, the stuff in your stomach going, you're sort of anxious and ready, and sort of you know, the adrenaline's starting to pump. Are you waiting to start a new job or start a new school? You know there's something about to happen. It's about to be on the move, but now you just, it's not there yet. It's happening, but you have to to wait. There's a sense of anticipation and a sense of excitement. And honestly, there are times I feel that way about us. Over this past year sort of being apart, 
It was awesome for Thursday night and Friday to have people in church again and, and feel like, bam, it's, it's going to happen. So that, that sense of excitement began to grow. You know, new leadership and sort of team working behind the scenes and kids in school. You kind of have a sense that God is on the move, doing something significant here. That God has cool things in store for us as a ministry for you and for me. We don't know exactly what that means, what it's going to look like. We're going to follow where God is leading. I don't know if God's going to stuff this place full of people. He'll say, you know, let's launch a new satellite ministry in the east where the population is growing. I don't know what that looks like. But right now, as we move out of you know, pandemic mode and start to reconnect, I, I think we all have a sense that, that God is moving. Hashtag on the move. <laughs> We're all just kind of in that final stage of, of waiting. Waiting for this pandemic to finally be over. Can I hear an amen? amen. Yeah. So what should we be doing in this, this season of waiting? Just zone out, stay idle, do nothing, just sit around and wait? I believe there's some specific things that we can be doing now in preparation for what God is calling us to do. Check out verse 12. Then the apostles returned to Jerusalem from the hill called the Mount of Olives, a Sabbath day walk from the city. When they arrived, they went upstairs to the room where they had been staying. And then they all joined together constantly in prayer, along with the women and Mary, the mother of Jesus and his brothers. This group had been through a lot. Just over a month ago, they a month ago they had watched the parade and the celebration. They'd watched Jesus crucified and dead, and then they saw him alive. But, but just now, he's left them again, and they're the ones God has said Jesus is appointed to start the movement, and, and it's time to go. But but not quite yet. You are to be my witnesses, he said. So on a side note. I read an article in an outreach magazine while I was waiting. It said this, quote, Evangelism is dead in the Christian church. Today people believe it is wrong to try to foist our Christian beliefs on other people. Seriously. Whole article about that. So I began to think about the outreach part and I had to stop a second and step back. What's the first thing that they actually did? They all joined together. They held on to each other. There are plenty of hard times in life when it isn't about what you say to a person or saying the right things. It, it, sometimes it's just being present, just being with people in those times. And the word today is sometimes in those moments we get, we get to process everything together. Think about it, talk about it, share ideas and perspectives and share our feelings and we were made for relationship. We were made for this sense of community that God often works best through people. And God's at work in his people when they support and they encourage each other and help each other out. In fact, Jesus said in Matthew, where two or three are gathered together in my name, there am I with them. And the letter of Hebrews said, let us consider how we might spur one another on to love and good deeds, not giving up meeting together, as some are in the habit of doing, but encouraging one another. See, the reality is we actually do, we, we need each other. So who do you have to go to, to lean on, to be encouraged by in those times when you have to, to wait? Who are your you know, go-to people when stuff happens? Who do you call? Because being part of a, of a missional church that we're striving to become is really going to be about creating friendships and, and relationships with each other so that every one of us has some brothers and sisters in Christ we can stand beside, who will stand with us in those days we don't know what to do or what's next to be with us and to pray. Alone we're exposed, but together we're strengthened. So what did they do when they were waiting? The disciples all joined together. And they prayed. I don't know about you, but there are times in my life when there have been you know, stress or anxiety or frustration and I kind of turn inward, not to God. I try to sort through, figure it all out. The disciples knew they had no idea what was coming next. They didn't really know what Jesus was asking them to do other than be a witness. What does it mean? What's going to happen when this power comes upon us? 
How are they supposed to establish the kingdom of God without the king? And so they prayed, and they prayed together. And I've laughed over the years. I remember when I first started praying out loud, a teacher in fifth grade said, pray out loud. So my friend Danny Frask and I, we'd walk home from school, and we'd just talk to God while we're walking home. Felt kind of weird, came kind of normal. I remember in high school, there was a group of kids I didn't know in a new school, new high school, and we moved to Minnesota. There was a small group that met, and people were praying out loud, and I sort of felt like, and about two people ahead of me, I'm thinking, what am I going to say? I don't want to sound stupid, right? So by the time it gets to me, I want to say something that, that sounds Christian. And so people have that sense of praying together, and for some, it's kind of a private thing. It's hard for people to say, I, I don't know what to say when I pray out loud, because I don't want to sound goofy. And we have this crazy idea that somehow to pray is to have, you know, the cadence and flow to our words that sounds rather profound and poetic. And we say big words we don't normally use. We just spent a month in the season of Lent talking about prayer as a, just a conversation. I don't even have to close my eyes so if I'm driving I can pray and I'm going to close my eyes then. You know, I, I can just talk to God and I can talk with you about God together and we share these thoughts and concerns. In fact, I think some of the most intimate moments of human existence or when we get together with one another, open our hearts before God together and pray. They were there in those moments like we had. God, I don't get this. Why am I just waiting? What am I supposed to do? When am I supposed to jump on this? You can imagine what the prayers of those disciples must have been like those first days. Verse 15. In those days, Peter stood up among the brothers, the believers, a group numbering about 120. And he said, Brothers and sisters, the scriptures had to be fulfilled in which the Holy Spirit spoke long ago through David concerning Judas, who served as a guide for those who arrested Jesus. He was one of our number and shared in our ministry. For, said Peter, it is written in the book of Psalms, may his place be deserted, let there be no one to dwell in it, and may another take his place of leadership. They gathered together, they prayed. What's the first order of business, Scripture says? Got to replace Judas. They searched the Scriptures. What does the Bible say? So as they're thinking and praying together, reading the Scripture, what does God say? What do we do now? Well, here's what God says. Here's what the Scriptures say. Let's read the Psalms. There were 12 tribes of Israel. There were 12 disciples. This is the old kingdom. This is the new kingdom. We probably ought to have 12 leaders again. And they found that all scripture is God-breathed and is useful for teaching, rebuking, correcting, and training in righteousness so that the servant of God may be thoroughly equipped for every good work. They, they turned to the scriptures. What was the criteria that they used to replace Judas? Verse 21. Therefore it's necessary to choose one of the men who have been with us the whole time the Lord Jesus was living among us, beginning from John's baptism to the time when Jesus was taken up from us. For one of these must become a witness to his resurrection. First, the person had to be with Jesus from the beginning. And second, and most important, one of them must bear witness to the resurrection. So we sometimes forget there were 12 disciples, but there's this group of 120 beyond them that had been following Jesus. They grabbed these two guys who literally had been with Jesus from the beginning. It wasn't just the 12. There's a, a whole crew of people that followed Jesus from place to place, saw what they saw, heard what they heard, and witnessed the resurrection of Jesus. And so they nominated two men, verse 23. Joseph called Barsabbas, also known as Justice, and Matthias. Then they prayed, Lord, you know everyone's heart. Show us which one of these two you have chosen to take over this apostolic ministry, which Judas left to go where he belongs. Then they cast lots, and the lot fell to Matthias, so he was added to the eleven apostles. What do you do when you wait? They all joined together, and they prayed, and they searched the scripture, and they sought God's will. They didn't know exactly what was coming, but in this moment, we'll trust God. God, what is your will for us in this moment? Who's the new leader supposed to be? Show us which one. You went and reviewed the Lord's Prayer during the season of Lent. You know, Hallowed be thy name, your kingdom come, your will be done. 
The challenge of being a a Christian community is that we grow in our knowledge of the Word of God, that we understand God's will, that we grow to trust what He says and shape our, our thoughts and our attitudes and our actions around living as God intends, submitting our desires and our priorities to the same mission that they did, to bear witness to the resurrection of Jesus. If we all get the point, we're still a part of the movement. So I have a question. Who'd you talk to this week about Easter? Who you shared the gospel with? Talked about the fact that you follow Jesus because he rose from the dead and he's worthy of giving your life to. Who'd you say, "I I think Jesus really was the son of God and he loves and forgives you and wants you to follow, he will teach you how to live. Who do you share that there's this God who who is a guaranteed forgiveness of sins and a guaranteed promise of the future, a guaranteed relationship with God, the God of the universe, who actually says he loves you? Who did you tell? The movement was not just about those guys. It is about us. I read this quote this week that said, a passion for missional life is not optional. Since the chief question is not whether you have a heart for the lost, it's whether God does. Jesus ended his gospel. These are written that you may believe that Jesus is the Messiah, the Son of God, and that by believing you may have life in his name. Jesus came so we could face the reality of what we have in this world and say, I know I'm lost, and I know that I have been found. I know that there is life. When I feel like I'm lost, when we as the people of God, the church, part of this movement, hear that we are lost and face moments when we mess up, and I know that I'm messed up and lost, we hear God's plan shouting in our ears. We understand the story of Jesus. My sins are forgiven. I don't have to fear death. Life could be filled with identity and meaning and purpose. That love is not a wish or a dream. Love is real. God shows it. He proved it. He demonstrates it when we watch Jesus. And living in grace and following Jesus, it literally is worthy of our lives. So who'd you tell that? Who are you sharing that story with? When when big and small things happen in our life, and you don't really know what it means yet. We usually try processing in our head. How many of you, something happens, you're not sure what to do, so you kind of worry and fret? Or how many of you, are, I do the numbers. Got to get the details all together. And with our imaginations run wild, and very often it's those worst case scenarios that flip through our brains. Is that you? What I've found is that if I'm processing alone, I have this little infinite loop in my brain. I get stuck. And sometimes I get it wrong. And it's critical in those times when I waste a lot of energy and a lot of time to step back and find some people that I trust, some wise people who I know love Jesus to share with, to talk with, to sort of reason out what is going on and what do you think God is trying to do? And, and, And push other people. What do you think God's trying to teach you? What's he trying to show you? That's why being a part of a Christian community, excuse me, is more than just shooting the breeze. That's why we study the scriptures together. That's why we apply what God says to this current situation. As the disciples were waiting, they began to internalize over the next 10 days. This movement isn't over. And God puts the responsibility on us. They begin to come to terms with the fact that they're going to spend the rest of their lives telling the world what Jesus has done. Because the world needs to know. And the very same power of the Holy Spirit they were waiting for is the very same power of the Holy Spirit that is given to you and to me. 
God, God placed his name on us in the waters of baptism. said, I baptize in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit. You have been given the Holy Spirit. The same power that was unleashed in them has been given to you. To grab hold of the story of Jesus and to believe it's true for you, that's the work of the Holy Spirit calling you to faith. When you come in, you got this card. Part of it is to try to find out a way as a church as we get through pandemic mode and we try to reconnect with each other. Are there people in your life that you know are fellow Christian people that, that pray with you, that support you, that stand with you? Who are those people? And if we don't have any of those people, that, that, how do we as a church help to connect us together? It doesn't necessarily have to be like we're joining a small group, but are there other people in the life of the church that you call and say, I, just, I want to talk about that sermon today. I want you to hold me accountable to talk to somebody this week. Or this is what's going on in my life. Would you just, just pray with me? So there's a place for you to fill out this card and drop it in the box as you leave today. It's sort of one is this faith at home video stuff. If you have kids, you can check those off and get those texts at home for your kids. And there's a, a video that comes out for adults sort of a, to inspire you to think about the sermon and apply it. And we're also going to begin this week to pray. Um, every day there's a sort of prayer prompt, something we're going to pray about every day this week. As the disciples got together and they prayed, we're going to challenge us together. Will you pray? So sign up for that adults part of the texting and you'll get those prayer prompts. They'll also be available in the weekly update that's sort of published today. And if you're just in that place, I'm not connected to anybody here yet. Check the box that says connect me. Help me get connected to a group of people. And we're going to work together as we come out of pandemic mode to sort of build a, a movement of us together in community. The first chapter of the book of Acts ends with them waiting. So you got to come back next week to find the next part of the story. In the meantime, the prayer for today is this prayer. Please give me a deeper and stronger relationship of trust in God so grace and forgiveness overflow from my heart. That the first prayer of this week is, God, I want the story of Jesus to so impact my life that grace and forgiveness is a part of the way that I live. And I see the world through this gracious forgiveness of Jesus for me. The movement is just beginning. We got several weeks to walk through the book of Acts and walk with these disciples as they begin to start and launch this new church. That movement, it continues with us. So who's the one person you're going to pray for? One person who doesn't get Jesus yet. We're going to build our witness to them in the weeks ahead. What would I say? What would I do? But start today. How would I pray for them? Who can I be praying for? Our prayer as a church is that the celebration of a facility is also the launch of this movement of the gospel into this community and this neighborhood and the life of our family and our friends, that they would come to know the Jesus that we do.